Welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron. This is Scott. This is Tucker. And we're back with season three. All right. So it's season three. We, um, wow. We've we been, I mean, technically the way the way we do it is we have seasons. And so like yeah. season one, we started in 2020, release it every week from July through the end of the year. And then we did that in 2022. And so a lot of people have been asking us, did you guys quit the podcast? And we're <laughs> like, no, 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 we, we're still doing it. We just taken six months off because we work at the Gospel Broadcasting Network, all three of us, and there's lots of other programs that GBN puts on that we work with and try to help. And so um, we spend half the year mm-hmm. trying to to help those programs, you know, explode and, and reach people too. And so, you know, in the last year, there's lots of programs that we're, you know, I guess, proud of. I, you can have, I think you can have certain people, you can't be proud of anything. I don't think that's right. But you can be proud of things and you know, Counterpoint is a program yeah. that GBN that we love. Uh, Preaching the Gospel is a great program. Uh, Cliff Goodwin, Tucker just was integral in like revamping the look and wow. got new episodes of that. You can Cliff's always go great. search Preaching the Gospel, Cliff Goodwin, or you can just go to GBN's YouTube page where a lot of these videos are posted and you can see the other programs. Yeah. And there's another podcast that just released like three or four weeks ago called Make It Plain with uh, Eric Garner, Cameron, and Key. Yep. And so it's the Eric, Cameron, and Key. I think they have in the right order um, show. But they, they're they just three guys sitting around a table just like this talking about Bible stuff. And so yeah. their yeah, theme, watch it. yeah, Check it out. it's good. The thing, Make It Plain, I think it's from like Habakkuk 2-2 where it says, yeah, it make it plain so those who run can read it. I think the idea is like somebody's like running through the market. You know, they didn't have like hmm. Facebook. They had like a, like a bulletin board, probably made of stone back then. But like you run by and you can see it really quickly and you keep running like, those who run by can read it. Like it's simple. You don't have to stop and think about it for a long time. It's the so, authentic blip, uh, uh, billboard. The authentic billboard. That's yeah. right. There you go. So their their whole goal of their podcast is like make complicated Bible things simple, make yeah. it plain. So, um, but yeah. So we're back for season three, and uh, we'll do however many episodes we do, and probably about the same as normal. What twenty? You'll know by the end of the season. Yeah, yeah. At the we end might of the season, change. You'll know. I mean, we normally schedule about twenty seven. So yeah. yeah, what we. First season, we ended right at the end of the year before New Year's. Second season, what, one or two weeks into the new year. Yeah. yeah. That's special. Like that. It'll be yeah. about that. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and hop in. So we're glad to be back. Thank you for watching. And um, so the first episode we're doing is the chronological breakdown of the books of the Bible, right? So the goal of this is there's 66 books in the Bible, right? Well, 39. Song every time you say that. What, you want to sing the song? Yeah, I'm not going to. Not the Old podcast. Testament? I know the song for the New Testament. The kids yeah. Matthew, song. Mark, Six, Luke, and John. In the Bible. Oh, I don't know. Anyway. I don't know that one. I just know the New Testament because to this day I'm 37. And I still, when I'm thinking of book of the Bible, sometimes I'm like, I'm like, to the Romans, first and Corinthians, yeah. Galatians, and Ephesians. Okay, that's where, you know. But the Old Testament, um, I don't know a song for, but someone actually, I did, I was speaking in Oklahoma, Tulsa, um, at Coweta last, two weeks ago, and I was riding in the car with one of the members, of the, the, the preacher there, the minister, and his daughter was in the back, and I said something about the books of the Bible song, and she's like, oh, about the Old Testament? I was like, there's an Old Testament one? So she rattled that thing off, and I'm telling you, I don't know how she memorized it because it did not like the New Testament one flows for me, but the Old Testament I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna learn. I'm gonna just memorize them straight out like I've done. No, I I can't. I can't. I don't know the Old Testament one. I just have memorized the Old Testament books in a real weird, wacky way. But, but anyway, so when we think about 66 books of the Bible, like the goal of this this episode is to help us understand how they all flow together. Because personally, I remember like reading through the Bible, maybe one of the first times I read it for myself. And I read like through Genesis all the way through like first and second Kings. And that section is pretty much like, that's, you know, five, 12, 17 books. It's pretty much chronological order, right? Kings and Chronicles kind of parallel. So like you'll read the same events and different accounts, you know, Um, but it's like two different accounts of it. But then I got to like Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And I was like, wait, wait, what, what happened? Like (laughs) I'm confused. And then I started reading the prophets and I'd read like a a major prophet talking about this king. I'm like, wait a minute, that guy died like eight books ago. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And so that's whenever I started to read this chronological, it was like a timeline. It was like a a reading plan that was chronological. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden things started to click. I was like, ah, I get it now. So we want to do an episode like that where we just try to talk through the books of the Bible. Now, Do you have that reading plan? uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know where it is. 
but I could find one. I'm sure I could find one somewhere. Okay. I'll look for one and try to put it on the podcast resource page where That's we'll right. have all the resources that we discuss in this episode. And so, um, yeah, so we're going to go through and just work our way through the Old Testament. This will probably be mostly Old Testament because New Testament chronology is pretty easy. It's like, mm-hmm. Matthew, I'll just do it real quick. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, written to tell you about the life of Christ. Now, we have a hand, a graphic, a beautiful graphic that we're going to give out for free download. Um, it's on the podcast resource page. Mm-hmm. Um, the origin of it is I, I taught a, a youth, a class for the youth group when I was back in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I was like, you know, I want to help them to do this. So I typed out a word document and I did one line for each book of the book of the Bible and just typed yeah. out a quick little summary. So I gave that to Tucker. And next thing you know, there's this like really cool looking graphic. Oh. Um, you did the hard work. I gonna just be a, be a good copy poster. pasted. Well, it's like our skill sets, right? You're good with graphics and I'm just good at like typing out stuff. So I typed out all the information, gave it to him. He made it look cool. Oh, and so it's going to be a like a poster, I guess. You could. I think we're going to do it like you could download it as a Word doc. Because okay. you uh, you have it in your Bible, I think. Yeah. You shrunk it really small. Yeah. Because some of the, the one of the things on this podcast is to help make tools mm-hmm. and to be able to study better. And so... We can make, there's going to be a Word doc available where you can just print it off your computer, black and white. Okay. You could shrink it, put it in your Bible, or we're going to also have it available where it's like 11 by 17 poster. Where awesome. if you wanted to go somewhere and print it off, put it in your church building or something, I definitely, I want one just because it's cool. Like, yeah. what's, I think what's the breakdown of that? great in the kids' classrooms. I plan on yeah. getting the file, maybe making some posters and putting them up. That's I awesome. They, I don't know. I don't know where, but we're going to use it with our kids for sure. Okay. And it'll be really high like def. Like probably. Tucker will make it a really big image, so you can yeah. blow it up as big as you want. I mean, not as big as you can, but like a sixty foot, you know, thing. That'd be great. <laughs> but <laughs> make a vector art version. <laughs> <laughs> but we're yeah. we're going to have that tool, and so you'll be able to basically look at this one page document and go through it. So well, yeah. let's go ahead and dive into it. So you know, we talked about. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. The way that I remember the Old Testament, which is good one, is going to be what we focus on a lot in this episode, is by the numbers 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. That's like the five divisions of the Old Testament that we have in our Bibles, right? So the Jews did it a little bit differently, but it's the same books, right? Yeah. So um, the first five would be the books of law. Mm-hmm. This is what some people call like the Torah, right? Um, then you have the 12 books of history, which is going to carry you from, you know, Joshua when they go into the land all the way up to Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And then you have the wisdom uh, literature or poetry, which is like Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Then you have the five major prophets and you have the 12 minor prophets, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you'll get to see the poster, you know, I'm sure when Tucker, whenever we get the final, we can just throw the, like, you'll see it like right here on the screen right now, there'll be a little, or right here or right there. And so, um, but yeah, you're going to be able to to have this. And honestly, if, as you're watching this, it probably would be cool. If you have like, if you're watching on a computer on a phone, it'd be Mm -hmm. difficult, but on a computer, you could probably pull the chart up and look at it as we go through it. Yeah. That'd be cool. So if you wanted to pause the video right now, go download the chart should be really quick download and then open it up next to your computer. If you're on your phone, sorry, you know, they'll just (laughs) have to listen. If you're on Spotify, you can't see any of the things we're talking about anyway, but you can always go check out the the TV version. So um, let's go ahead and start with the first, you know, the first five, which is the five books of the the law, right? Or the Torah or whatever. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, right? Those are the first five. So let's just start with Genesis. What are some of the major, I guess, events that happen? And as you look at this chart, like if you're a really you know good knowledgeable Bible student, you're going to be like, oh, their chart doesn't have Sodom and Gomorrah and Genesis 18 and 19. Yeah, because there's not room for every event in a book yeah. like Genesis. That it's an know, overview. It's yeah, an yeah, overview. Yeah. It's just hey, we threw some in there, and if there's some events that we left out that you think are maybe really impactful, we forgot. You can always write them in, you know, yourself. But it's not a study guide for your Hebrew history class. Yeah, no, not totally. It's just trying to give you an overall view so that you can say, oh. I don't know much about this book, and maybe that's a book you want to go study more. So let's start with Genesis. Yeah. What are some major events that happen in Genesis? Oh, yeah. Creation, fall, right? Fall of what? Fall of man? Like so same. creation? Yeah, creation right. of the so Adam, universe. Eve, yeah. what happened with them. And then I guess you could argue, like, what happened with everyone leading up to the flood, mm-hmm. which is the flood, of course, obviously, and Babel and Abraham, the promise being made to him. Mm-hmm. And you follow through his life, his children's life, Isaac and Jacob, and the beginning of the 12 tribes of mm-hmm. Israel going off into Egypt. Which I think is cool. You mentioned, you know, the creation, the, the global, you know, the fall, sin entering, the global flood, Tower of Babel, where languages 
like a lot of this human history, the things like, well, where did different languages come from, right? Like the Bible gives yeah. you answers to that. Yeah. And then the book of beginnings, Genesis. Yeah, that's what Genesis mm -hmm. means. Beginnings, yeah, I think in Hebrew. I don't know that much Hebrew, so. Um, then you talked about the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And you mentioned it. You know, when you look at like the 12 tribes of Israel, you say, where'd that come from? Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And so he had 12 sons. Yeah. And so the 12 tribes were the descendants of his 12 sons. So it's like pretty simple, but sometimes you're like, you know, where did you read the New Testament? Like, you know, so-and-so was a Benjamite. Like, what is, what is that? Is it a city? It's like, well, no, it's from the, you know, the descendants of this person's name. Yeah. You know, so, in, you know, Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. What's that? Yeah. Mean? Judah I mean, was one of his sons. Side note, a little bit more obscure, but even the idea of what we call Jewish people Semitic, right? Yeah. Where they came from. Shem. There you go. So yeah. Shem. Semitic, now, Shem wasn't Semitic. one. Now, Shem wasn't one of the 12 sons. He was right. one yeah, of. Not to confuse it. Sure. One of Noah's sons. That's right. But the different people, especially that we refer to in that area, even today, yeah. come from those three sons. And yeah. we still call them that way. You have a Semite was from the Shemite. Right? That's right. That's right. Just send the age. Noah's son. Yeah, Shem. So, and I think European people from Japheth. I read a book, a really old. Yeah, and I think Hamitic ended up being towards Egypt and Africa, yeah. that area. Yeah. So, Ham, you know. Shem and then Japheth, Europe. So I forget. I think it's like an N.B. Hardeman sermon, maybe that I was reading in a book. I'm pretty, I, I'm, I'm positive it was a book but that he wrote. The beginnings, right? Yeah. The beginnings of even the nations. That's right. So. Beginning of languages, Babel. Yeah. yeah. All those things. Mm -hmm. So what's, okay, what comes after Genesis? You've got Exodus. What happens in Exodus, Tucker? Yeah. Exodus, we got Moses, you know, Pharaoh, let my people go. The plagues happen. Um, you know, you get Red Sea, it's plaguing the Red Sea. <clears throat> Mount Sinai, this is where the Ten Commandments come in later, Mosaic Law, Tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think too, like sometimes it's easy for us to forget how much time has transpired in books like in Genesis. Uh, what is it, like 1,500 years or something in the book of Genesis? I mean, because it, it goes from Adam, you know, Adam lived 900 years, and then you go all the way up to like Noah, who's, I think Noah's grandpa would have walked with Adam. And then I think I, maybe I'm wrong. I think it's like 1500. Well, okay, here you go. I mean, it depends on how you want to count the, the age. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, but okay, let's think about this. The earth seems to be according to the Bible, right? We're not going with evolutionary standards and all this, uh, um, inaccurate radiocarbon dating and all this stuff that they try to say, well, dinosaurs were 50 million years ago and we found them here. Therefore the land has to be that old. Well, how do you know the land's that old? Cause dinosaurs are here. Mm -hmm. Circular reasoning. But 6,000 year old age of the earth, Abraham's 2000 BC. So, I mean, there you got, that's at least 2,000 years between Adam and Abraham. So you've got, let's just, is that right? No, let's it's, just say, it's about right. Genesis is Moses like 1,500 like years. 1,400, 1,500. Yeah, I think the Exodus 15. was 14 something, 14 yeah. something BC. David was the uh, 900s. Was yeah, the David is about 1,000 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we don't have those exact dates because that's not really not the point of that one page. Some of them we do. We have some of the dates in there. But but yeah, that, so the idea is Genesis covers this massive span and then you get to Exodus and the plagues and the Red Sea. And then after that much time is when they're given the Ten Commandments and the rest of the Law of Moses, which yeah. Deuteronomy 5, we talked about this in previous, says it was given not to their fathers, but to those people that came out of Egypt. So all of the people that lived from Adam all the way up through the time where the, the Jewish people, the descendants of um, Jacob, the Israelites, were given the Law of Moses. Everybody else continued under the patriarchal covenant. Now, Another resource we're going to reference and we'll have in the podcast resource page is a giant, like eight foot long Bible timeline that Apologetics Press has done. It's awesome. Um, there's a video to uh, Jeff Miller talking about it on the podcast resource page. And that chart does a really good job of showing you, you know, Adam, Noah, the flood, all the way up to where Mount Sinai was and where, you know, the Israelites got the law of Moses, but everybody else wasn't under the law of Moses, right? It was only given to them. And so that timeline helps with that. The tabernacle, which is the word tent, mm -hmm. right? And so that was given, which was where the people would go and worship God as they moved, right? You'd go in through the, like the, the I guess it's maybe the south side. It was east. No, east. Based east, right? <clears throat> I don't remember. I Man, you got me stomped. Okay. I don't remember. I didn't look at that for before we looked at this. <laughs> but anyway, you come in through the tent and you go into this court where there's like the altar of, of uh, like sacrifice, and then you go into the holy place and there's like the table of showbread here on my right if I walked in and the lampstand. And then there's another veil, the Holy of Holies, which is where the Ark of the Covenant is, which you can only go into once a year. 
well, you couldn't go. The high priest could go in once a year. One person could go in. Yeah. And that's where like God's presence dwelled in the cloud when they moved, right? Like that's the tabernacle. That was like the precursor to what became the temple. But you read about that in the commandments and how to build it in Exodus. And then after that, what book comes next? Leviticus. Leviticus, which I believe means belonging to the Levites. And it's the, the, the whole book is how to be holy before God, right? Mm -hmm. So in Leviticus is where you learn about a lot of things that you're like, you know, you learn like, hey, why this is why you can't eat certain foods. You know, you can't eat certain under the law of Moses, not today. Yeah. You couldn't eat certain foods. It's where the read about a lot of the instructions for sacrifice. Yep. Yep. The brazen altar, I think, is Leviticus 16. You read about the Day of Atonement. You read about what happened. And we'll talk more about this later. Another episode we're doing, Does God Accept All Worship? Yeah. Because there's this idea today that no matter what you do, as long as you do it with a like an okay heart, God's cool with it. Like, doesn't matter what he said to do. And, hey, God said this. Well, we're going to do something different. But, hey, we have, you know, we, we love God, so it's okay. Yeah. And that's where you learn about the story of Nadab and Abihu, right? Yeah. That's when I was, when I was preparing notes for that episode that we're going to be talking about. Yeah. In verse, in chapter 10, in verse, let's see, two or three. Okay. Just saying like, Moses said to Aaron, this is by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. And just that idea of tying that into worship instead yeah. of just doing every one. It's like, we have to worship God. He's holy. You can't just do whatever yeah. you please. But And that's an important story because like, the fundamental principle taught there is God tells you how to worship him. And when you approach him, you have to do it his way or else there's yeah. consequences. It establishes, it's an extremely important principle because that's tied into why we do so many things the way we do. It, it's the idea of permissive versus, oh, that's not the right way to say it. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Can I do it because he, dis, he didn't tell me I can't? Yeah. Or yeah. do I do only what he told me? to do yeah it's the idea is is silence permissive you know like yeah if yeah, something yeah, if the bible if the bible doesn't talk about it like if the bible says do okay. this it's the idea some people say well if the bible didn't say not to specifically you can do it yeah yeah and so we'll talk about that more and yeah. works, the other works for edward real yeah. well at home all the time Trust yeah, me. yeah. <laughs> it's sarcasm <laughs> <laughs> so we got genesis exodus leviticus <clears throat> then we have numbers right what why is it called numbers or where, what happens in the book of numbers counting yeah numbers i mean obviously they count the number of soldiers that they yeah. have right the, yeah. the census for the soldiers they leave sinai and as they leave they are just so thankful for what god did for them bringing them out of Egypt. is that what happened that's sarcasm yeah, that's, right there that's sarcasm that's, that's what right. they did yeah. that's right no they complain and god sends plagues and then they send the spies mm -hmm. into for 40 days into the promised land and the spies come back and they say what we can take they it say Ten well, of them said what? Yeah, as I okay. was going to say, as a caveat, uh, ten of them say, no, nah, we can't take it. Yeah, and they said, we're like we're like grasshoppers. We yeah, can't take them. Who are the two them. that say we can? Caleb and Joshua. That's it. Who end up being, I believe, the only two that get to go into the promised land other than, I think, the Levites. I don't think the Levites are the one included in the injunction that no one can go into the promised land. I might That's have to double interesting. Check. Yeah. I haven't, haven't really thought about that. I think long. it says, yeah, I don't know. I might have to double check that. I believe it says something about Caleb and Joshua. They, yeah. They're the two that say we can take them. I mean, God literally just parted an ocean and wiped out Pharaoh and his army. And so you, then you're going to say, yeah, but those guys are big. I don't think we can take them. Yeah, they lead everyone who was, was it 20 or below or is it below 20? Something like Whatever that. Whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, into it 40 years later. Yeah. Everybody that's over 20, he says, is going to die in the wilderness. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know. I think there's a caveat to that with like the Levites, but I won't be able to find it in this quick moment. But okay. So they wander and then Deuteronomy. Deuteros means second in Greek, and nomos means law. So second law is what Deuteronomy is. Mm -hmm. It's basically a repeating of the law of Moses. Yeah, it's like the second giving of the Second law. giving. It's it's just like they're reteaching it to who? The new generation that's about yeah. to go into the promised land after wandering for 40 years. And then at the end of Deuteronomy, you have the death of Moses, and then Joshua takes over, becomes the leader. And that's the ending of the first five, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, mm -hmm. and Deuteronomy. And so then you start. Do you have something you're going to say? Yeah, once you finish. Go ahead. I was just going to make a note. <clears throat> now, y'all can correct me. I think it was written in the last two months, or this takes place in the last okay. two months of the 39th of the 40th year of their wandering. Okay. I think you're right. Yeah. Because that's basically where he gives the, basically like the blessings and the cursings mm -hmm. on Mount Ebal and oh, yeah. Gerizim. Yeah. Yeah. Before they go across basically into the promised land. And it's him saying, look, this is this is the law that was given, like you said, about forty years ago, mm -hmm. and so now you guys need to basically 
determine who you're going to follow before you go to land. Moses dies, and now Joshua takes over as the leader. Yeah. So or that's the famous statement of choose you this day who you who serve. you'll serve. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have basically then you begin the book of Joshua, which <laughs> starts your next twelve. So you had five and twelve. So the next twelve starts with Joshua, Judges, Ruth, right? So the book of Joshua is where they cross the Jordan. I mean, if you remember in Joshua chapter six, that's where they take the city of Jericho, yeah. which is the first city that they take in the land of Canaan, right? And then throughout the book of Joshua, they're fighting, they're dividing the land between the tribes, and then Joshua dies. Now, look, I love the book of Joshua. On the GBN app uh, or on like our Roku, Apple TV, we have a books of the Bible section, and we have two different people, I believe, that teach through the whole book of Joshua, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, which is just a fantastic lesson series. But for the time, the time we're spending, it it deals with a lot the 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 life of Joshua, and then Joshua dies, right? And then the book of Judges picks up, and what happens over and over in the book of Judges? Just a cycle of uh, faithfulness and departure. Mm-hmm. You know, they they begin to suffer, they cry out, the Lord reaches out, He sends a judge, He saves them. They're faithful for a little while and then go right back mm-hmm. over and over. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much the whole book. Yeah. I mean, it shows you at the very beginning, maybe chapter two, and then I believe the very end, I don't know if it's is it 17, I can't remember how many chapters it has, where it talks about how basically the people um, did what was right in their own eyes. Yeah. And that was the reason for this awful book. Judges is some of like the darkest times of Hebrew history, man. I mean, one of at least the top three where they, like you said, they're faithful. Yeah. And then they start leaving God and they go into bondage. They're like slaves and they're punished until they cry out to God and he delivers them. And then they, for a certain like, amount of time, are faithful. Verse, and every man did what was right in his own sight. Yeah. Right. And it's in there twice, like chapter two and maybe 17. That's why I think 17. I think it's like 17, 21 or something, but I don't remember. Yeah. I think of it as a good example, too, of um, placing only the principle of forgiveness. You know, I don't, I don't, we don't yeah. talk about it like that a lot, but if you're looking at it from the perspective of God down to them, you know, how many times ought to you? Forgive your brother if he trespass against you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not saying they were his brother, but you know, it's, you it's that principle of law. He did God's it forgiving. way back then. Yeah. They cried out. They said, please forgive us. Please help us. Please save us. Mm-hmm. There you go. I was wrong. There's 21 chapters in Judges. 21, 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Mm-hmm. And that the book starts out in chapter two, I think, saying the exact same thing. Yeah. And so, you know, the book of Judges is where you read about Samson and Jephthah and Gideon and all these different judges, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot in there. And then after Joshua judges, you have Ruth. Now, Ruth starts out, I believe, at the very beginning of the book. Yeah, Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1. It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. So when you read the book of Ruth, it's taking place sometime during the book of, of Judges, right? And so Ruth was a Moabite woman who chose to follow the God of Israel, Jehovah, um, and the whole story is about her, about Boaz redeeming her. And she ends up being in, um, uh, in the lineage of Jesus. And at the end of Ruth 4, 17, it says, also the neighbor woman gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi. They called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Mm. So you got the grandfather of King David. So this is once again, more backstory. And Ruth, who was a Moabite, ends up being in the lineage of Christ, which is awesome, you know? So there's all these stories about somebody then, even back then, who was not an Israelite. So what if it's the grandfather of King David, perhaps this is the early years of Samuel or something, maybe? I don't know. Uh, have to look into that. Uh, yeah, good. Look into that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is one note that maybe I got from you, Aaron, but it's okay. like a takeaway from Ruth is that God uses his people to fulfill his promises to other others, and then faithfulness and virtue shine bright in a dark and prejudiced world. Well, that's a great note, so I'll uh, take it. Your yeah. attribution. I don't know that it came from me, but maybe it did. I forget a lot of things. <laughs> Scott's like, yes, you do. <laughs> so, I do too. <laughs> me too. So you've got Joshua judges Ruth, and then you start into what you just mentioned, first, first and second Samuel. The last judge of Israel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so what happens in first Samuel? Well, I mean, that's him um, being born, right? Yep. I mean, how did Samuel come about? You know, yeah, very similar in a sense. Uh, well, his to mother, the other judge, um, Samson, right? His mother prayed for him. Yeah, his mother. His mother prayed and said, "Basically, Lord, if you give me a child, I'll dedicate yeah. him to you." Hannah. 
Uh, Hannah, yeah. And Eli actually thought she was drunk because I guess she was over there mouthing and he basically went over. I think it was what it says. He Didn't he say that? Thought he was, and he went over to her and said something and she basically said, look, I'm, I'm not drunk, I'm praying. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I thought at the beginning of first Samuel. Maybe you I'm, know that seems vaguely familiar. Okay. Um, I probably so, need to brush up on my So then history. God gives her a child and basically she does exactly what she said. She dedicates him to God and he basically serves under Eli and Eli's sons were wicked. Hmm. But Samuel is a godly godly man it raises up and so throughout the book of first samuel you have basically samuel coming up you have the ark is captured and i think first samuel six it's returned by the uh, the philistines and then finally you have israel that says we want a king like everybody else we're not happy with god being our king we want a king and so god tells samuel look they asked for it. Let him have it. And he says, look, he's going to take your men. He's going to take your women. He's going to take all your stuff. That's what a king's going to do. But if you want one, I'll give it to you. And it says he, some other place says, I gave them a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath or something like mm-hmm. that. So God says, I'm going to give you what you want, even though it's not good for you. And he gives them the first king, which is who? Saul. Saul. Yeah. yeah. And then after Saul, you've got King David. And First Samuel has got so much where David fights Goliath. It's where David has the issue with Bathsheba. So many bad things that happen. Hosea 13, 11. Is that I gave him the king gave of my... Gave king of my anger and took him away in my wrath. Yeah, okay, neat. So we'll get to... Hosea's later. It's a minor prophet. But So all these things happen in the book of First Samuel. It's history. It's still chronological, right? Then you get to Second Samuel, which is where David uh, is made king finally after he had many opportunities to kill Saul, who was pursuing him, and he didn't because yeah. he said he would not lay his hand on the Lord's anointed, right? So David's made king. David returns the ark, which is another story we'll look at in our Does God Accept All Worship? Or no, maybe we won't. I don't know, but Uzzah. No, that's a good one, though. Yeah, that's good yeah. One. It's about do you do yeah. again what God, what God said? And even if we, even you if you have it? good intentions, if yeah. you do something yeah. God didn't say to, what's the punishment? Yeah, you're you trying know? to save the ark. Yeah. Man. That's pretty good intention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was in his his uh, Benedab, house of Benadab, which is his father, for, I mean, like 20 years. Yeah. He didn't touch it, apparently. I mean, I've said this before, but imagine putting a golden ark in the corner of your living room and telling Edward not to touch it. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know all the cir- circumstances. He'd be dead that day. I, mean, yeah, I don't know the circumstances, <laughs> but it was in the house he grew up. Well, I guess grew up. I don't know his age, but it was in his house for 20 years. Yeah. And he didn't touch it, allegedly. I don't know. So. Um, then you get into 2 Samuel, like we're talking about. David's made king. He returns the ark. That's where Bathsheba happens, Uriah. And it's actually likely the events where Psalm 51, which we'll get to later, comes uh, back and is written, right? So if you think about a lot of the Psalms written by David, a lot of them, right? Not all of them. But that means if the Psalms are written by the time of David, we're over here in 2 Samuel. That's the time of a lot of the Psalms that were written, right? Yeah. Then you got 1 Kings. What happens in 1 Kings? What ha- David's son takes uh, yeah, over. You start, you start reading about the early... I know people call First Kings, Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles like history books. Yeah, you start reading about that history of Israel yeah. in this perspective. You're seeing Solomon now. You're seeing his mm-hmm. building of the kingdom, and you're seeing some of the the building of the temple. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you see some of the bad parts too. You know, yeah. you see the idols come in, which mm-hmm. happened because of the choices he made with how many people he married. How many people did he marry? A lot. Did he have like I seven hundred thousand wives and five hundred, yeah. which is a secondary Wasn't, wife. Or yeah, a, it is a wife. Uh, it's not. Some yeah, people yeah. think a concubine was like just someone he had sex with for pleasure. That's not true. Yeah, a concubine a was a, a lower wife. estate wife. He still uh, married so them. Yeah, like nine hundred oh. something wives. Yeah. In? I don't know, man. I thought it was a uh, thousand wives and five hundred concubines, but I don't remember. I don't it could it's, be the other way around. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. Anyway, he had his own personal army of wives. Sure. Sure. Say it that way. Sure. Uh, so you see the idols and the corruption begin in Israel, which leads you right up into the next big era in Israel's history, yeah. which is their struggle with idolatry mm-hmm. and how that ends up splitting the nation and everything. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. No, that's covered, still first Kings. But, that's good. But that's, that's where that starts. That's where that begins is under the reign of Solomon, mm-hmm. you know, greatest King of Israel. Also the one that ultimately, in my estimation, led to its downfall, mm-hmm. its civil war, mm-hmm. uh, and Babylonian captivity in yeah. the end, right? Yeah. I mean, so in First Kings, Solomon, like you said, builds a temple. Idolatry becomes a big problem. Um, the nation is split. Now, this can be kind of confusing. This is where you start seeing the northern ten tribes be called Israel and yeah. the southern two called Judah. It can be confusing because you're like, wait, Israel, isn't that all the tribes? Isn't But for this portion of time, you've got Jeroboam who leads this rebellion and takes 10 tribes north. And I think it's in um, 1 Kings 12 where he sets up this false worship because he says, hey, you know what? 
I can't let those people go back to Jerusalem and worship, or they're going to basically try to restore the kingdom. So he sets up false worship, which we'll look at in the Does God Accept All Worship portion, that episode later in the season. And then Rehoboam keeps two, Judah and Benjamin maybe. Um, and I can't remember the exact thing. I know it's Judah is one of them. I think it's Judah and Benjamin. But you have two tribes here that are called Judah and the, the northern ten, which are called Israel, right? And in First Kings, Elijah is the focus. At the end, it mentions Elijah, Elisha, Elijah with a J, and Sha are two different people, right? I have a buddy who's named Elisha. People call him Elijah. I used to drive me nuts. I'm like, his name is Elisha. Call him the right, don't call him the wrong name. And you should know these different people because you go to church, right? <laughs> so, but Elisha is introduced in First Kings, even though Elijah is the focus. And then Elijah with a J passes the mantle to Elisha, who's the focus in the next book, Second Kings. And in Second Kings, Elijah's taken up in a whirlwind. Elisha becomes the focus. Assyria takes the northern 10 tribes in about chapter 17, in about 721 BC. That's one of the few dates I remember. And then you had some good kings like Hezekiah, Josiah, and um, then basically at the end of 2 Kings, you talked about the captivity. Yeah, yeah. That's when the captivity of Judah begins. I guess you could say captivity started for Israel with Assyria. 721, they were wiped out. Yeah. And they were intermingled, I think, different places. Um, yeah, the captivity begins. Uh, where are we at? We're at Second Kings, right? Yeah. So Babylon, they take them away for how many years? 70. 70 years. Yeah, around 70. Yeah, there's like three leadings away mm-hmm. in that process. What, the first one's like 612? 606. Is it 606? 596. What was 612? I don't remember. Oh, well. It could have been. I don't remember. Go check the dates. Don't listen to yeah, me. I think it's 606, 596, and 586 because like 10 years. Yeah. Something happened in 612, though. I don't know if that's when Babylon conquered no. I don't know. We'll look it Assyria, up. Assyria, maybe? Go look it up somewhere. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Try, those are, there's lots of dates to remember. And then so. you skip over to what? Um, First Chronicles starts, yeah. this, right? And, yeah. And that gives you genealogy recap. A lot of the information kind of is rehashed in some areas mm-hmm. in First and Second Chronicles mm-hmm. because the idea of, well, First and Second Kings was written, what, before the captivity? First and Second Chronicles, maybe after the captivity? I think most people, I think most that, right? that I've read believe that First and Second Chronicles was written maybe by Ezra. That's off the top of my head, but it was written know. after captivity. But think of like yeah. First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles are different accounts of similar events written by different people. It's almost like Matthew and Mark. Yeah. You read Matthew and Mark, you get some of the same events, some different perspectives that all fit together. Yeah, you know? and my point is just that they are written for slightly different audiences. Yeah. This is like pre, sorry about that, pre kept I pumped your mic, pre-captivity uh, before ba- Babylon, first and yeah. Kings, and then after, because they they're they catching people up. Yeah. For, I mean, for a long time, yeah. you, know, you know, these people didn't have worship assemblies. They didn't have the readings of the law. They didn't have all those things. They had, mm-hmm. that's where what, uh, they tried to do something, and that's where we get the in synagogue, Babylon right? synagogue worship. Yeah, yeah synagogue yeah. worship starts there as a kind of stopgap. Yeah, they don't have the temple, they don't have all that. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles are sort of parallel accounts. Now, that takes you to where I would say, well, that's where the so end of Second Chronicles and Second Kings, you have the Babylonian captivity. So, like, if you pull up the graphic that you, if you have been doing it, the graphic that Tucker made that I thought I had somewhere on my desktop. Well, let me see if I can find it. I do right here. So this is where on that chart, after 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, in yellow it says, uh, parenthesis, Babylonian captivity, time of Ezekiel, Daniel, parts of Lamentations, right? Now, the reason we have that is because like Ezekiel and Daniel uh, don't come until like the, the major prophets, right? Which is further down. But after 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, they go into Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, and, uh, you know, I believe it's Nabonidus, maybe, and then Belshazzar. Those, those were the kings that people are in captivity for 70 years, right? Now, if you read from Second Chronicles to Ezra, you can be like, well, wait a minute, what happened? In Second Kings and Second Chronicles, Babylon took over, but in Ezra, you've got Persia's now ruling. There's 70 years between those books, right? So if you're going reading through the, the, the table of contents in your Bible, Second Chronicles, you go to Ezra. Now, Ezra is when Cyrus, who's the king of Persia, basically says, hey, look, you're going to go back and build God's temple, right? You have lots of, you know, you have Artaxerxes, you have Darius, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, which Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, this is confusing for some people, I'm sorry. But the end of your minor prophets, the very last books of your uh, Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, that's the time these three books are written during about the same time as Ezra, after captivity, right? 
So you have Ezra, you have Nehemiah, which is where they rebuild the wall. And then Ezra reads the law and reinstitutes the feasts. So they were taken into captivity and then they come back out. And like you said, they're trying to get things back in order, right? And then you have Esther. What's the, what's the whole story behind Esther? Queen of Persia. Yeah, she becomes I mean, the queen she of Persia. She becomes queen of Persia and she uses her position to save Israel from the schemes of an evil man in the king's court. Yeah. Known as? Haman. No, I'm Haman. I just yeah. pronounce it different. Right. Maybe it was, get yeah, you yeah, like, maybe hey, it was like that. Yeah, technically, who knows how they pronounce it? I don't. I'm not an expert on that. But yeah, me neither. In English, we just say Haman. Mm-hmm. Good old-fashioned Haman who yeah. uh, got hanged. Hangman. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's yeah. <laughs> built gallows to hang Mordecai, and he got hung on him. Yeah. He, uh, he was going to try to destroy the uh, Jews out of hatred for yeah. Mordecai. Yeah. And so I would say those 17, that's like the end of what I'd say is the strictly chronological, like, you know, first five books, then you lead into Joshua, Judges, all the way down through. Now there's a gap before Ezra where you have the Babylonian captivity we have on our chart. But then you get into what's called the five wisdom. We know this episode is going to be longer than 28 minutes, so don't even worry about that anymore. Oh, yeah. I'm not, where, it's, it's I, knew, just, I knew you weren't worried. I'm, I'm about to actually shut that down. Go ahead. Oh. You can just shut it down. So this is where you get into the five, the next five. So we had five, 12, five, five. What are the next five? We got Job. Mm-hmm. Psalms. Psalms. Oh, Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. That's right. So I remember that J.P. Pez. I always remember Pez. weird things like, Pez. but J.P. Pez, that's how I remember it. And so Job, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, right? And so, you know, Job, this is kind of a cool thing about the Bible chronology is that we would look at Job and think what? Like if you just in order, you'd think, oh, this is t- during the time of Persia, right? Mm-hmm. If you're looking at it chronologically. But then you start reading through a lot of the things that it talks about. And what are some of the things that, that you see in the book that give you sort of a hint that, hey, this book is actually a lot older. It's not during the time of Persia, but it's way before. The time of the flood or, or after yeah, the flood? Or- Job 22, I think, references yeah, after the flood. The yeah. flood. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Job twenty two sixteen. Let's see, um, verse fifteen. Will you keep to the old way which wicked men have trod, who were cut down before their time, whose foundations were swept away by a flood? Okay, so if that's talking about the global flood, which it, it could be, then you know, you know, okay, it came after it came after Genesis six, right? Because that's when right. the flood was, right? Mm-hmm. So what what are some other things in in the book? How old he is? Okay, yeah, you know, his age is is typical more with the generation. Uh, Abraham lived in. Yeah, I think I think it's at the end of the book. I know you know other ones, so while I'm looking it up. All right, yeah. Um, another one is the fact that he's offering sacrifices. That's, you know, there's some different ideas okay. about that and the way that the law worked and things like that. Mm-hmm. Depending on what view you take, that might be an indicator of when this took place. Because um, he's offering in the first... the fact that he's attacked, I think it even mentions by the Chaldeans, which okay. is, is Babylon. But, okay. you know... What is Babylon doing coming and taking some of his people from Babylon raiding him? Yeah. If this is after Persia. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Not that ethnically they'd have to be wiped out with genocide, but still it just doesn't, it doesn't fit with the way that the Bible talks about these different groups. Well, you also mentioned him offering sacrifices. If you, during the, the law of Moses, parents didn't offer sacrifices for their kids. Priests offered it for the people, right? Yeah. Levites. So if you go back and say, why is he offering sacrifices for his kids? That seems to be saying, hey, this is during the time of patriarchy yep. where the fathers offered sacrifices for their children like Abraham and all those other people, you know, in the book of Genesis. And so the one that you mentioned was talking about his age. Uh, let's see. At the very end of Job, Job 42, 16, it says after this, this is after Job had him as his wife had born and he'd raised 10 children. He'd built his wealth and his flocks. He basically had lived a full life, which means I'm guessing he's what, 50, 60, 70, right? Let's just, let's just say he's 50, right? That's the younger side, right? Then all this calamity happens. His friends come, he goes through this whole ordeal. Then it says in verse 12, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 female donkeys, 1,000 yoke of oxen, seven sons and three daughters, right? So he has 10 more kids, right? And then look at verse 16. After all that, Job lived 140 more years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So he died old and full of days. So when you do the math, you know, you can get to the point where it looks like he's living, I don't know how many years, but basically down to four generations after seeing 10 children raised, 
you know, this is putting him likely back during the time of like Abraham's grandparents, like, yeah, you know, Nahor, yeah. Terah, Especially that age. If you view that as four generations past the second set of children he had. Yeah. You know, if it's them and yeah. then he's seeing his grandchildren and then his great grandchildren and yeah. his great great grandchildren. Yeah. You know, and, that's cool. And that's after he's already lived that life before. Yeah. And think about it too. All of his possessions were wiped out. Yeah. They were wiped out when the mm -hmm. devil came and tempted him. Mm -hmm. How long would it take you to build back up? Would you say 14,000 what? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, a little while. Well, and, and even, you know, uh, even you think about in the book of Ezekiel, which is written the time of Babylonian captivity, it mentions Noah, Daniel, and Job as men of great faith. So it's like Ezekiel is talking about how the faith of Noah, Daniel, and Job. So Job's a real character mm -hmm. that Ezekiel inspired by God thought to mention, which means he, he had to have happened before Ezekiel, right? So and, and he, he basically talks about him alongside Noah and Daniel, which just shows the great faith he had, right? So that's, yeah. that's the book of Job. And what comes after Job? Uh, Starts Psalm. with a, yeah, Psalms, right? Psalms. And so there's 150 chapters, 150 Psalms of praise. Some are by David, some are by Solomon, some are by Asaph. I think actually some are by Moses, right? And so it's a compilation. It's like our, it would be like our modern day hymn book. Yeah. Some are unknown. Yeah, some are unknown. Yeah. And then what comes after Psalms? You've got what? Proverbs. Okay, now Proverbs was written during or by who? Uh, Solomon. Okay, so timeline, you know that that's going to come First Kings, right? So whenever you're reading First Kings and you read about Solomon and it talks about all the different things he wrote, the Proverbs, well, this is some of them. This is the ones that seem like God selected for the ones that were the best. I mean, so, hmm. you know, that's that's the timeline. And then you get to the next book, which is what? Uh, Ecclesiastes. Okay, written by? Uh, Solomon. Solomon, once yeah. again. So yeah. time, first kings. Yeah. Right? And um, well, I mean, how would you summarize Ecclesiastes, Tucker, if you had to summarize it like What's, what's the point of life? Yeah, without who? With, uh, without God. Yeah. Yeah. With God, life's meaningful. Without him, it's vanity. It's yeah. empty. It's one yeah, of my favorites. Why? Because it's going to end. Yeah. yeah. And then that's it. Yeah. And you won't know anything. And all of your things that you work so hard on are going to go to somebody else. Yeah. They won't appreciate them. squander them anyway. <laughs> yeah. So what's the point? Yeah. And with God, the point is work hard, help others, teach yeah. people, live for God, mm -hmm. teach people to live for God themselves and die and go to heaven. That's the that's you know? the difference between the worldview of there is a God and there is an eternal right. destiny and there is nothing after this. That's right. And Ecclesiastes, I mean, Solomon lived it all, man. He had all the women. He had all the wealth, all the riches. Yeah, and, and he, he said, realizes, I tried to find fulfillment in that too. Yep. I went down the list and tried everything that was under the sun to try to make myself feel fulfilled, happy, accomplished. And then I would always realize this doesn't mean anything. Yeah. 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 The he, wisest he did it all. man yep. ever lived. Yep. And he went down the list and tried it all and said, yeah, it's pointless. I mean, like, I don't mean, I don't like to try to make too many parallels, but like, okay, who's the richest? I mean, I don't know if he's still the richest, but like Elon Musk, right? Yeah. He's extremely intelligent, right? He's, everything he touches is turned to like worth millions and billions of dollars, right? He's world famous. He's wise. He's rich. Imagine somebody like that who tries everything they can try. Imagine if Elon Musk had a thousand wives, which I don't think he could do in the U.S. thing still. But anyway, imagine he has all these things. And then at the end of his life, he basically says, yeah, it was like worth nothing. Like as soon as I started yeah. following God, that's yeah. when I realized my fulfillment. Like that's what I wish so many of these rich, famous people would yeah, realize. It's like, like, he like, finally colonizes Mars and he gets old and he dies. He's like, yeah, it's pointless. Yeah, it was all pointless if yeah. you don't have yeah. God in your life. Yeah. That's what's cool because it's like, oh, what if I want to go make this decision? When you look at Solomon, he's like, he's already done it. It's like, well, mm -hmm. this is where it's going to, the end result's going to be. And then it kind of, it's all, you know, the book of wisdom, Proverbs. Mm -hmm. It kind of saves you the trouble to yeah. going love, through that. I love Ecclesiastes. Yeah. People might think, well, that's a little melancholy of a book or whatever, but that's like, to me, the one of the most, that's, that's the most important lesson. I'll go ahead and say it. From my opinion, that is the most important lesson you can learn from the entire Bible as far as mm -hmm. principle mm -hmm. that's going to guide your life because that sets your perspective. Without that perspective, you won't care about anything else. Yeah. yeah. If you don't view salvation, the eternity, pleasing God as the highest priority, yeah. then even all the things in the New Testament, all the sayings of Jesus won't mean anything to you because you don't care. Yeah. So if you don't, and I'm not saying you have to read it before you read the New Testament, be saved or anything like that. I'm not trying to don't read more into it than what I'm saying. Sure. All I'm saying is 
one way or another, you have to realize the lesson of Ecclesiastes, whether you get it from Ecclesiastes or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's an extremely important lesson. Don't yeah. sleep on Ecclesiastes. Yeah. That's my wife's favorite book. It's yeah. Jamie's favorite book. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's definitely mine. Yeah. And so you have all these things in Ecclesiastes, and then you have the song of who? <laughs> Solomon. Solomon. First Kings 432, I have it on the chart, talks about how he wrote hundreds of songs. So this seems to be like the ultimate one, right? Which is a long song. I've written, I did music before and I wrote songs and they were never that long. There were shorter versions, but it's the ultimate song and it talks about courtship, marriage, reconciliation, like all these different things, right? And so that wraps up the five books of wisdom or poetry, whatever people want to want to call it, right? So now we've got five of history, tw well, no, five law, 12 history, five wisdom, and now the last 17 are prophets. And so you have the major prophets, which means they're more important, and the minor prophets, which means they're less important. Yeah, that's right. No, that's, yeah, okay, I've seen if you're awake. Um, the major prophets, what's it just mean? Just means they wrote more. Yeah, the books are bigger. Hmm. And the minor that's prophets it. books are smaller. Smaller, right? And so when you look at the first five, you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, and if you don't know how I remember these, is when I first memorized them for a class, I wrote out Isaiah. And under the uh, I, the second I, I wrote like I J, like H I J. And so I would write no under the H. No, let's see, Isaiah. No, I know what it is. Okay, I wrote out prophets. Sorry, I'm trying to remember this. I wrote out prophets, and then under the H of prophets, I wrote H I J. You know, like the like the alphabet H I J. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I wrote H I J, and then LED light. So I remembered there being like an H I J, and then an LED light at the bottom. So I remembered Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Right. Huh. So people come up. Jamie thinks my wife thinks I'm a weirdo, and I just like, like, how do you remember this? And I tell her, but whatever works for you, yeah. right? Yeah. So you have Isaiah, yeah. and Isaiah is a prophet. Yep. And if you go look through, and you're reading through Second Kings 15. You're going to read about King Uzziah. Now flip over. Tell me what Isaiah 1 1 says. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, mm -hmm. which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Perfect. So it says in Isaiah 1 1, it gives you the time frame, right? The vision of Isaiah, which he saw concerning Judah in the days of Uzziah, right? All you have to do is go back in your Google. Or go back in your Bible and look up those kings. Uzziah was first, what did I say? First Kings, what did I say? It's on the chart. I, um, I think I have, I'll have to double check this. Second Kings 15. Yeah. I also have written in my Bible, Second Chronicles 26. I have Jotham, Second Chronicles 27. Ahaz, Second Chronicles 28. And Hezekiah, Second Chronicles 29. So that's the time frame. So, I have a note that says uh, it's a book of prophecies and it tells of Jesus' birth 700 years before yeah. it. Yeah. Which is Isaiah 53. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So those books like Isaiah, there's a lot of the prophets calling people back to God saying, look, y'all are living very sinful lives and you need to, to repent and turn back to God or God's going to bring somebody and he's going to punish you and you need to repent. And the people say, shut up, Isaiah. We don't, I probably don't know. Probably not. <laughs> Be quiet, Isaiah. We don't want you to talk about that stuff. So prophesy smooth things. Jeremiah is the same thing. Don't, don't talk about it. They, they didn't want to yeah. hear it. They didn't want to hear about repentance. They were diamond. Saying, they had like, bro, you're, you're saying it's pretty rough, man. We need something smooth. That's right. You know, what you're telling us is that we need to give up all this bad stuff and turn back to God or, and he's like, yes, or God's bringing Babylon and they're going to punish you. And they're saying, no, nah, nah, like, stop saying that. Can we just hear only the like, can we just hear good, motivational positive, sermons? Positive, uplifting your verses? sermons are really, your sermons are really negative, can Isaiah. They're not, all about repentance. Yeah, I want to hear more about, you know, like how the Lord's going to bless me and, <laughs> Sound familiar? we're always going to be safe. And, yeah. yeah. You're right. We hear the same thing today. Like, you know, you preach on something and people are like, Aaron, man, like, I mean, uh, you know, or preachers, I know preachers very close to me that have said, man, my congregation is complaining because I'm always preaching about tough things. I'm like, well, if they need it. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, even him, I know, mixes in encouraging stuff here and there. But in Isaiah's day, they didn't want to hear it. Yeah. And a lot of people today don't want to hear it. And Isaiah, like you mentioned, Isaiah 53. Do I have that on the chart? Because that's great. You, I don't. Isaiah 53 is like the yeah. prophecy of Christ's, you know, crucifixion, you know, 700 years before it happens, right? So you have Isaiah, you have Jeremiah. Jeremiah is around, people argue about these dates, but 60 years maybe after Isaiah. Um, go to Jeremiah. Let's look. Does Jeremiah 1, I think, have the exact same sort of time statement? There's 66 chapters in Isaiah. Okay. Jeremiah 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, the priests of the priests who are in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, he came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. All right. 
So in the 13th year of his reign, I think that's like 627 BC, right? So you have this Jeremiah, he's a prophet, 2 Kings 23, I think. And he basically comes and tells Jerusalem the same thing, which is, look, y'all are serving idols. You need to repent or Babylon is coming. And they don't listen. And well, some of the kings do. Like Josiah was a good king, right? Hezekiah. But after all the wicked things like Manasseh did, God said to Josiah, look, you have tried to rectify this, but Manasseh is so evil that Babylon's still coming and you're still going to captivity. It won't happen in your lifetime, but it's still coming, right? Yeah, that's pretty hardcore because yeah. even Manasseh repented at the end of his life, He did, right? and it's not it's, like, it's not in Kings, but it's in Chronicles, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. That's like you repented and the king after you wanted to do right and tried really hard, mm-hmm. but you just you really messed it up. Yeah. It's too late. Well, I mean, think about Manasseh. I think it's Manasseh. I, I, sometimes I get these out of order. So if, you, if I'm out of order, forgive me. I don't know everything. Um, my wife would say, like, you think you do. But, <laughs> um, but you know, Manasseh, it says, offered his sons, passed his sons through the fire to Molech. And then his other son, Josiah, becomes king. I wonder if that's why Josiah hated the child sacrifice so much. Like, hey, what happened to my brother? Oh, your dad passed him through the fire to this false god. Yeah, he, like, like aborted them after they were born. Yeah, yeah. So... Basically, then Josiah tries to just rectify everything. But God says, look, I, it's still Babylon captivity. Babylonian captivity is still coming. Yeah. So that's Jeremiah, right? And then Lamentations is written by Jeremiah through inspiration. But Lamentations is him lamenting or mourning. And it's five funeral songs. And you miss this in English. But if you know Hebrew, I'm not saying I do, but then basically there's five funeral songs. And each one, like, go look at your book in Lamentations. So look how many verses chapter one has lamentations. So chapter one has how many verses? So it's 22. 22. It's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, I believe. Look at chapter two. How many verses? 22. Cool. All right. You know, so like in English, we have 26. So if you wrote something like, uh, if you wrote a song that verse one started with an A, verse two with a B, verse three with a C, D, E, F, all the way through 26, that's what this is written in Hebrew. So, you know, the first things, I forget all the Hebrew. I haven't been written in another part of my Bible, but you basically go through and then chapter three, I think actually does it three times. I think chapter three is 66. Yeah. Then chapter four has 22 again and chapter five has 22. Hmm. And so basically there are these five funeral songs basically that lament for Judah and Jerusalem. And it's crazy how so many of the predictions in Deuteronomy 28 it's not crazy. God did it, but it's prophet prophecy. He said, if you don't follow God, if you do these things, then these curses will come upon you. Deuteronomy 28, man, read Lamentations, read Deuteronomy 28 and then read Lamentations. And the things that God said were going to happen then absolutely happened. And, you know, he's crying over this destruction of the city that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon did. And so the people then go into captivity. And what about Ezekiel? Where is Ezekiel and Daniel? These next two are written during what time frame? Uh, I don't know. The Babylonian captivity. Ezekiel? Yeah. Ezekiel, yeah. Uh, I think it's written a little bit before. Visions. Yeah, because it's kind of complicated, but remember there's three deportations. There's 606, there's 596, and there's 586. Yeah, there's the first where they take away the highest ranking and the nobles and the rich and all yep. that. And then the second time around, they take people that they left initially that they were hoping run the land mm-hmm. and they take them and finally you're left with the last one which yep. is basically we're gonna take everybody but the lowest the low and i think ezekiel was deported in the second deportation that's what i have on my chart right well, we made yeah. i mean i made this chart 596 yeah. yeah so if there's a if there's something in there that you're like i don't know if that's right like just check it out right always remember everything that humans write you should check against scripture yeah. but i'm pretty sure that ezekiel the evidence would point to him being deported in the second deportation yeah so he's deported and he's by the Chibar Canal and God gives him visions of this stuff that's still happening in Jerusalem because it's not another 10 years till 586 when the temple is completely destroyed, right? And so then, so that's kind of like during... That makes sense, yeah. I think about it because what he, he had to do... Ezekiel's the one that had yep. to do the uh, He had to lay fire. by and dig through the wall. He had to cook over. And he was supposed to cook over dung. And he yeah. said, a human dung? And he yeah, said, God, can I please use cow dung? And God <laughs> said, yes. <laughs> like, it's disgusting. But yeah. the whole point of it was supposed to be a picture to the yeah. people. Yeah. You need to repent or this is what's going to happen to you. He had you to know? lay on his side a certain amount of days. Yeah. Beside it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's Ezekiel. Yeah. And Ezekiel is, you know, it's, it's, it's basically this book that talks about, look, this is what's going to happen, you know? And there's lots of visions and prophecies that we don't have time to go into in Ezekiel. But then you get to Daniel 
And Daniel was one of the best that was taken during the first deportation yeah. in 606. And what are some of the stories of Daniel? Everybody knows Daniel. He's, oh, yeah. he's one of the, he's probably the best known prophet. I and mean, the first one you know that, that really yeah. comes up is how he stood ground on trying to keep himself pure, keep himself holy in terms mm -hmm. of his diet. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a pretty good way to start off. If mm -hmm. you're going to go ahead and be taken away, it's like, let me immediately make sure I'm doing it right. Cause I know why we're here. Yeah. And then um, what are some other ones? They wouldn't bow down to the king. Vision. Wouldn't bow down to the king and he got thrown into a what? Fire furnace. Fiery furnace, right? Well, his three buddies did. Yeah. It's the three book of Daniel. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. Han and I, Azariah, Mishael, or their Babylonian slave names, Shadrach, mm -hmm. Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, even before that happened, just the, the vision, being able to yep. interpret the vision. Interpret yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Proving what about um, he got thrown into a lion's den? Lion's den, right? Yeah. So these are all stories mm -hmm. that talk about Daniel. And the thing about Daniel, if you read through Daniel, you know, after the last book of the Old Testament, there's this 400 years of silence. We have it on the chart, right? After Malachi, what happened? Well, you can look at world history and see that it matches up. Daniel prophesied in Daniel chapter 2 and 7 and 8 that there was going to be this transition of world kingdoms. He even mentions them all by name except for Rome. So he literally mentions during his lifetime that Babylon's, Babylon's going to be conquered by Medo-Persia. Persia is going to be conquered by Greece, right? He mentions He basically predicts it before it ever happens. And that's what happens in world history. The book of Daniel uses apocalyptic language, which is really important when you get to books like Revelation that use like pictures from Daniel to paint a picture to the people in the New Testament, right? And so that's your five, your next five. You finish that. So you have five law, 12 history, five wisdom. So five, 12, five, five. Your second five is your major prophets. And then the last 12 are probably the least well-known, which are the minor prophets, right? Um, the Jews had them in one book they called the 12, right? So like I have so many notes in this Bible, I'll probably never replace it. <laughs> but so I have like law, his, I basically clamped it down one day and wrote it but because I don't have the tabs like some people's Bibles have. Law, history, wisdom, major, and then minor, the 12. And so these 12 are the minor prophets. Now, nine of the 12 were written before what? Uh, before Babylonian exile. Yeah, that's right. So the first nine, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, <laughs> all written before the captivity. And then the three, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, were written after. So Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi are the same time as like Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, right? Yeah. And the first, Joel through Zephaniah, are during the time of the kings and Isaiah and Jeremiah. And our chart is going to help you a little bit, but I think the best thing you can do is go get that Apologetics Press Bible yeah. timeline because they have the names like written there, right? Cool. I want to get one. Yeah, it's really cool. So, you know, that that really wraps up the Old Testament, uh, the, the, the chronology, right? Now, the last 12, I'm going to say this. If you want to learn more about the minor prophets, we'll put a link in the podcast resource page. Um, Eddie Parrish, who's the dad of Amos, who works at GBN, did a 12-part lesson series on all the 12 minor prophets. It's the first place I ever actually studied the minor prophets. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even know how to say Habakkuk, right? Like, let alone tell you what the book was about. And I remember the first time I studied it, I was like, I've wow, never, that is so that relative today. It's that. awesome, man. I'm telling you, I recommend it to everybody. Yeah. And I told Amos, Amos is just kind of uh, going back to work with his dad a little bit, still working for GBM. But I said, Amos, man, if you can like prod your dad and doing some more lessons, like yeah. let's, let's get it. Because they're so great. The lessons are so great. So, I mean, that's, so that's chronologically, like that's at least a, a general overview walkthrough of the Old Testament. Like there's so many things in my notes that we just don't have time to cover because we're like, that's like 66 so books of the more. Bible. I mean, it's, it's entire quarters at school. It is. Te teaching through Hebrew history is what they often call it. Yeah. So it, it's nothing more than an introduction. Yeah. Whet your appetite and go mm -hmm. watch some of these series like mm -hmm. Aaron's talking about. Yeah. And then we'll, I'll recommend these two books that you can always get if you want to study more on each book. So this first one, um, I'll save the what I'd say the my favorite for last, but this one is written by Forrest Antimasaris and Hiram Kemp. It's called Last Will and Testament. It's a book-by-book -book survey of the New Testament, right? The New Covenant. So the 27 books of the New Testament, right? I haven't read all the way through that, but I know the guys that wrote it. And so I know it'll be fantastic. And then this book is called Know Your Bible. It's by Frank Dunn. And it's an analysis of every book in the Bible. This is one of my favorite books. Like when somebody 
like says, hey, I want to learn the Bible or somebody becomes a new Christian. And I, I gave away every copy I have except for this one. But that's the book. I was about to ask you that. No, man. you can't Come have it. On. I love you, but you can't have this one. You can borrow it, but as long as it doesn't leave yeah. leave the counter. I'll bring it back next time. No, 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 no. I need it too often. But this, so Know Your Bible. This is a book that is just fantastic. And, you know, it's just got, it has every book of the Bible. You know, like, let me just open to a random one. Uh, let's see. Uh, the book of Jonah. All right. It says keys to the book of Jonah, the key phrase, the key chapter, the message, the appeal, uh, the miracles, the purpose of the book. Um, uh, great lesson. I mean, if you're a preacher and you're like, man, I just, I have a hard time writing sermons. Just get this book. You you mean this literally like does it for you, you know, now you'll have to study it and you shouldn't just take your stuff out of a book. But I mean, this is just full chalk full of stuff. You know, like how many people know what the book of Zechariah is about? From my conversations with a lot of people, not many. He talks about the main theme. He talks about the date, you know, all these different things. He even talks about different references. And I mean, it's just a great book. And so if you really want to dive in deeper and say, look, I don't like to have blind spots personally. So if you're like, you know what? I don't have any idea what Zechariah is about. This is a great book to start, right? Yeah. And so those are two books that we'll have um, information on the podcast resource page. Um, we'll have lots of information on this one. And most oh, yeah. of it will be places that you can go do more digging yourself, mm -hmm. like you know, you wish you could transfer. I wish when I was learning that I could have somebody's Bible knowledge by like, like a shot, you know, like I'd love to get like, take your brain yeah, knowledge yeah, out and give it to me. for a, a, an update on Neuralink one day. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's, but yeah. the, the idea that you, I mean, you have to do your own work on this stuff, you know, yeah. and good resources is, is really important. Right. Yeah. And so we try to provide the resources that obviously we think are the best. Yeah. You know, there's gonna be other people that, Somebody says, well, this guy's a real good teacher. And we're like, well, we think that guy's a false teacher. You know, not because we don't dislike the guy, but he teaches things we don't think line up. So yeah. our goal is always for us personally to try to reference things that are good resources for you. Yeah. So yeah. you'll never you'll never master anything just watching and listening to us. No. No. We hope to inspire you to go and study yeah. on your own more. And any like any time that I'm teaching something, my goal is, hey, I didn't know this when I learned it. I thought it was so cool. And so hopefully we can just elicit the little bit of response because once you enjoy studying the Bible, man, it gets easy. Like I remember when I first started my mid twenties to like, to come back to church and to get faithful and to start studying. I remember thinking like, you know, I was an athlete in college. So I remember thinking, okay, I did not like running in college, but for my sport, I had to do a lot of it. Well, mainly it's just because the coach was like, did you throw your bullpen today? I'm like, yes, sir. He's like, go run for four hours, you know, I'm like two actually, but, um, you learn that, hey, if you want to succeed in something, sometimes you have to do things that are hard and yeah. you might not enjoy, but you know it's good for you in the long run. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, at that time, I did not enjoy reading my Bible. Uh, I didn't, because I didn't understand it, comprehend a lot of it, but I put the work in and the more I learned, you start to learn two or three new things. All of a sudden, a preacher makes a reference and you're like, oh, I know that reference. Yeah. And that feels good. And then you learn to love it. And once you learn to get over that hump of, you know, learning it and enjoying it, then man, it's all downhill from there. And then you start loving reading and stuff like that. So. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the authentic Christian podcast. This podcast has been sponsored by GBN gospel broadcasting network. You can download the app and start streaming every show, watch every episode and discover the answers to life's biggest questions today. Well, that's going to wrap it up for episode one. Anything you guys want to drop in there? Um, one cool thing I've learned over the last almost four years being a Christian is like in the Old Testament, you see a lot of verses that tell us to keep the commandment, to like obey God's law and to, mm -hmm. you know, if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. But then, and it, then it ties into the New Testament too, um, of warning us you know, about false teachers. And, mm -hmm. you know, if we love Jesus, if we, if we love him, we're his friend, we'll do what he says and keep his commandments. So it's cool seeing the thread of keeping God's word back then, even throughout the history of the Bible. That's a great point that we should have, I should have had that in my notes, right? What Tucker just said is really good because like anytime you look at something and you write a book report, you're supposed to know what the who, what, when, where, why. So like, who is it written to? That is one thing I've seen a lot, even recently, even in the church, I've seen guys who will teach somebody that doesn't know their Bible super well. Mm -hmm. They'll show them like a passage from Genesis or Exodus and say, see, the Bible says you have to obey this command. And then they'll hop to like a new text. They basically hop all over context yes. to teach things like Christians are supposed to keep the Sabbath or the Ten Commandments, like keeping the Sabbath has not been done away with. Sabbath is what I bring up because that's what I see the most. Yeah. But it's really important because if you don't know, 
oh, the law of Moses was written to Jews, the, the nation of Israel, not to Christians, mm-hmm. not to what we are as Gentiles, right? We're under the new covenant. If you don't know that, then people can really twist you around when they're hopping from context to context. So that's one of the yeah. most important reasons to know what books of the Bible were written to who. Now, Romans 15, 4, the things are written aforetime were written for our what? Learning. Our learning. Yeah. So we can learn things and learn principles, but that's a really good point, Tucker. I was talking to someone the other day about they brought up how we're still under the Ten Commandments, and we were just having a good conversation. So I didn't point out, like, we don't keep the Sabbath anymore, mm-hmm. but in that all nine of those carry over yeah. in the principles of it. But, yeah. yes, I mean, I've, I've been there. Yeah. But, I mean, we've all been there. Yeah, so yeah. That's what we're trying to do here. And it's important because there's lots of different things. It's like an easy analogy I've used is if you came to my house and I was building an ark in my backyard and I said, well, God told Noah to do it in Genesis 6, like you'd be like, <laughs> Well, yeah, but that wasn't written to you. That's an easy one. Yeah, go watch the video. That's that right. It's a, that's a video. Yeah, it's an easy one. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I'll put that in the, the yeah, uh, podcast. There's an in my backyard. That is a good one, yeah. I'll put it in the podcast resource page. I did a video like that. But then I basically say, nobody's doing that. Well, why is nobody saying that? Because no preacher's out there preaching it. But mm-hmm. then we get to the thief on the cross, yeah. and they say, hey, the thief on the cross did this. Well, the thief on the cross lived under the law of Moses, right? The new covenant, Christianity, which every person watching this today lives under, you've lived and you'll die under, didn't come into account until 50 days later, right? Mm-hmm. On the day of Pentecost. So you have to understand the chronology. Yeah. And so we didn't talk much about the New Testament, but I'll just do it real quickly. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, life of Christ. The book of Acts is like your history. And then Romans through Revelation. Mm-hmm. Every book, Romans through Revelation, is written to people who've already what? Been baptized. They've are, they're already the baptized gospel. Christians. They already obeyed the gospel. They were set free from their sins when they were baptized. Why? By the blood of Christ. That's when your sins are washed away spiritually, yeah. when you're physically immersed in water. That's why no one from Romans to Revelation, Paul will never say, hey, you think you're saved already? That's great. Now go be baptized. Yeah, it didn't exist. Everything after the book of Acts has mm-hmm. to do with you being faithful. That's right. It has nothing to do with converting someone. Acts is how you became a Christian, how you become a Christian. Romans to Revelation is what you do now that you're a Christian. Does he call them back sometimes to how they were converted? Yes, and he always calls them back to what? Yeah. Hey, Galatians 3.26, did you not know that when you were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ, yeah. right? Romans 6, all those different passages like that. So, yeah. okay, unless you guys got anything else to add, we'll wrap it up. Hey. We're done. Okay, welcome back. This welcome is back. Uh, season three and uh, end of episode one, and we'll hop back soon next week. We'll see you, and we'll uh, tackle another topic. Yeah. And we're thankful to be back for a third season, and thank you so much for taking the time to watch us. We'll see you next time. <laughs>